You are about to listen to a snippet of the Terra Incognita podcast. For the full episode, please click on the Patreon link below. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, it's extremely windy and rainy right now as I record this, so you might hear some wind in the background. I apologize for that, but I thought it's more important that I actually get this recording out in a timely fashion. So, yes, there's some annoying noise in the background, but hopefully that's okay. Um, This is episode two of my series on the discovery of Australia. If you haven't listened to episode one, I suggest you do that before listening to this. In the last episode, we spoke about ancient visions of the Southern Hemisphere. We spent a decent chunk of the episode discussing the Greek astronomer and cartographer, Ptolemy, who postulated that there was a large continent in the Southern Hemisphere, a terra incognita on the other side of the world. The ancients believed that this land was unlikely to ever be discovered because of their zonal theory of climate. Europeans believed that the Northern Hemisphere was separated from the Southern Hemisphere by a torrid zone. The torrid zone was believed to be unbearably hot. The sun in this part of the world scorched men's skin black and boiled the ocean. Ptolemy's map of the world was used by the Muslims who translated his work in the 9th century. They would eventually make it to the Southern Hemisphere. By the 1500s, they had turned the Indian Ocean into an Islamic pond. They controlled the sea lanes of Asia and Arabic was the lingua franca of traders in Asia and Southeast Asia. Some people believe that the Muslims actually discovered Australia as early as 1500. But hopefully I was able to convince you that the evidence for this claim is pretty questionable. In the last episode, I said that you can't understand Australia or the discovery of Australia without first studying the age of discovery. Most history books briefly mention that Australia was first discovered by the Dutch, then they go on to talk about Cook and the First Fleet. As a result, the European history of the southern continent prior to 1770 remains obscure. I'm trying to rectify this by offering a broader historical narrative. Instead of beginning with Cook, I began with the ancients. In this episode, I will discuss the Age of Discovery and the Portuguese. It may surprise some listeners to learn that the Portuguese are often considered the first nation to have discovered Australia. Indeed, in old history books, it is presented as an uncontroversial fact. The other day, I was reading a book called The Growth of Empire, which was published in 1902. I found it in a secondhand bookstore. Um, In this book, the author claims that Australia was first discovered by Portugal, who sailed down the eastern coast of Australia, um, you know, to the nation south. Today, many cling to this idea. In a small seaside town in Victoria, people meet once every year to celebrate the Portuguese discovery of Australia. The idea that Australia was discovered by the Portuguese is, as I hope to show, uh, controversial. But one thing is not controversial, and that is the fact that they uh, played an important role in setting the discovery of Australia in motion. The Portuguese were pioneers in European exploration, and for that reason alone, they deserve to be discussed. But I will also discuss the theory that they discovered Australia, which is not as ridiculous as the idea that the Muslims discovered Australia or that the Chinese discovered Australia. There actually is decent evidence to suggest that that could be the case, but we'll deal with that later on. In this episode, I want to focus on perhaps the greatest of those Portuguese pioneers, namely Henry the Navigator. Some people might consider this man outside the scope of our subject, but I think that is naive. Prince Henry the Navigator did not play an important role in discovering Australia, but he did set in motion the wave of exploration that eventually would lead to the discovery of Australia. For this reason, I believe he is an important man to discuss. After discussing Henry, the navigator, we will briefly discuss how the foundations of the Portuguese empire in Southeast Asia were set up. And finally, we will discuss the theory that Australia was first discovered by the Portuguese. So we will now return to Europe 
But we will not begin in the 1400s when Henry the Navigator first began trying to make contact with Asia. Instead, we will begin in the Dark Ages. After the fall of Rome, Europe contracted. The largest empire the world had ever known broke into a thousand warring fiefdoms. The well-established trade routes began to disintegrate and long-distance trade came to a halt in most parts of Europe. The miles of Roman roads were no longer maintained and the grand movement of goods that was coordinated and managed by the Romans fell apart. The cities, which had once teemed with people, became ghost towns. The city of Rome, for example, experienced a decline of population from around a million people to about 30,000. Similar trends could be observed across all major European cities. There was also a contraction of the European mind. Philosophy and science gave way to scripture and dogma. The spirit that questions and explores and denies and proves was put to sleep. Much of our Greek and Roman heritage was either rejected or forgotten. One of the earliest essays in scientific geography, written by a Christian author, argued that the world was flat. It also ridiculed the Greek doctrine of the Antipodes, which we discussed in the last episode. Just a quick refresher, um, anti means opposite and, and pedes means shoes. So the word Antipodes roughly means with feet opposite ours. Um, in this book that was written by the Christian author, he argues that pagans turn everything upside down rather than following the doctrines of truth. Um, I'll quote from the book a little bit. So, so here, here goes. For if two men on opposite sides place the soles of their feet against each other, whether they chose to stand on earth, on air, on fire, or any kind of body, how could both be found standing upright? You know, basically what he's saying, if people had feet opposite, imagine two people um, with feet opposite one another, surely one of them would fall over. That's basically what he's saying. Um, St. Augustine also rejected the Greek idea of the Antipodes on similar grounds. I'm going to quote him now. Can one imagine anything more absurd than that which the ancients have maintained, that there may be inhabitants in the regions of earth opposite to ours? Those who have said this admit that they have no knowledge by experience. It is mere conjecture drawn from certain pretended philosophical arguments. But assuming their propositions are correct, can we argue that, because these lands are inhabitable, therefore they are inhabited? The Holy Scripture, which is the rule of that which we should believe, says no word about them. It is agreed that the descendants of our first father could not have come to those lands. How then can it be maintained that there are men there? Okay, end quote. So, basically what I'm, what I'm getting at is that the, the scientific geography of the ancients fell into obscurity, and the European conception of the world contracted. It became smaller, just as their trade routes and territories had contracted and grown smaller. The idea of the Antipodes, which had been popularized by Plato, fell into obscurity. And I, I do think it is fair to say that Europe during this time, you know, the Middle Ages, was a narrow, inward-looking place. As Europe contracted, Islam expanded. In the 9th century, Muslims translated Ptolemy's books into Arabic. Muslim traders and men of science studied his map and set their sights on the Southern Hemisphere. Arabian travelers cooperated with Arabian men of science and surveyed every sea from Spain to China, from Cairo to Madagascar, from Java to Canton. Arabian merchants colonized the east coast of Africa, the west coast of India, and parts of China. Arabic became the lingua franca of seafarers from South China to the African coast. They, they really did turn the Indian Ocean into an Islamic pond. Muslims were able to get rich, selling the luxuries of Asia to Europe. Nothing could pass from east to west without going through them. From the Moroccan shores of the Atlantic to the coastline of Turkey, a barrier was drawn. A barrier that shut off Europe from communication with the Far East. The goods from India 
and the distant Spice Islands could only enter Europe if the Muslim rulers allowed them to enter. Western Asia, and especially the seaports of the East Mediterranean coast, were in the hands of the Arabian powers. This put Europe in a very complicated position. It needed spices to preserve its food, but the price of spice was controlled by their sworn enemies. Europeans had to pay exorbitant prices to buy uh, essential goods. You know, when, when the Turks captured Constantinople in 1453, they imposed an edict forbidding uh, all trade with Christians. This made vital spices totally inaccessible to Europeans. And when I, why do I say vital? Back then, you know, they don't have refrigerators. So the only real way they have of preserving their food is, is through these spices. To lose that is to lose your capacity to preserve food. And it's also worth adding that back then, the, these spices were believed to have medicinal, and, and they do have uh, medicinal benefits. So uh, in addition to losing access to their means of preserving food, they also lost access to medicine. So to summarize what has been said so far, Europe in the medieval era was a relatively isolated and self-contained society whose knowledge of what lay beyond its uh, own geographic boundaries was more fantasy than fact. This slowly began to change in the 13th and 14th century. Uh, once more, the spirit that inquires and explores was awakened in Europe. Uh, men like Roger Bacon translated Arabic literature and through Arabic literature, they became reacquainted with the knowledge of the ancient world. You know, they became reacquainted with the idea that the earth is a sphere. They became uh, reacquainted with Aristotle's idea of, um, you know, the zonal theory that we discussed previously. And um, they also became reacquainted with the idea of the Antipodes. Once more, the importance of the application of exact mathematical methods to the study of geography was explained and enforced. And once more, scientific speculation began about the unknown world of the South. Uh, the Venetian explorer Marco Polo traveled far and wide in Asia. His book, The Travels of Marco Polo, circulated uh, throughout the courts of Europe. Uh, nevertheless, true knowledge of the greater world remained limited until the 1400s. Uh, Europe during the 1400s was, you know, when compared with other parts of the world, relatively poor. Perhaps one of the poorest countries in Europe was Portugal. It was a peasant country which had spent much of its history under Muslim occupation. The Muslim occupiers had been driven out in the 13th century. They, uh, the Portuguese had pushed the Muslims, you know, back into Morocco in 1249. But in many ways, Portugal remained under Moorish domination even after the uh, Reconquista. The Moors continued to control key territories and ports in the surrounding region, such as Granada, Gibraltar, and Ceuta. From these strongholds, the Moors were able to control the rich maritime traffic that came through the Straits of Gibraltar. They were also able to launch raids against the Portuguese from these strongholds. Perhaps the most important of these strongholds was Ceuta. Ceuta is on the African mainland opposite Gibraltar. It's a place where the Mediterranean Sea meets the Atlantic Ocean. This means it is a strategic gateway for maritime trade. Ships passing through the Straits of Gibraltar, where Ceuta is located, had to stop or pass by this city, which made it a natural place for trade and commerce. The caravans from the interior of Africa came to Ceuta with all sorts of goods. The carpets and ceramics of the East, ivory and gold from Africa, and slaves from all over the globe came there. Ceuta was also the stronghold from which Muslim pirates launched their raids on the Iberian Peninsula. They would raid Portuguese villages and often enslave the inhabitants. Christian slaves were one of the city's most profitable imports. So the Portuguese continued to be plagued by the Moors even after they had pushed them out of their country. This began to change during the reign of Henry the Navigator. Henry the Navigator was born in 1394. He was the son of Queen Philippa and King John I. These two people were remarkable characters in their own right. 
King John had preserved his country's independence in a war with Castile, which is now in modern day Spain. His mother, who was English, was equally remarkable. During the 28 happy years of her marriage to King John, she made the court of Portugal one of the most respected in Europe. Um, a British historian describes her as follows. Queen Philippa possessed the puritanical temperament that is a peculiar product of her native island. It is one that has often been mocked, but which, when united with a Latin vitality and joy de vivre, may sometimes produce remarkable characters. And Henry the Navigator, the son of these two people, he was one of these uh, remarkable characters. At the time of his birth, Europe was beginning to awaken from the long slumber of the Middle Ages. There was a new unwillingness to acquiesce to authority, to tradition, to custom. The mind became distrustful of the accepted opinions and it became eager to investigate things anew. But this was also a, you know, a time of strong religious conviction. The crusading spirit lived on. Throughout his life, Henry would embody characteristics of both medieval and Renaissance Europe. This is what makes him such an interesting character. He was an extremely devout man, but also a man of science. He was a divided personality, a Janus with one face looking into the medieval past and one into the new age of scientific thought. When Henry reached 17, King John decided that it was time for him to be knighted. Typically, one received their knighthood by fighting in a war, but there was no wars at the time because uh, Portugal had signed a peace treaty with Castile. So there was no available battlefield on which the young prince might win his knighthood. To remedy this, King John suggested that uh, he should hold a series of tournaments to which all the European nations would be invited to send their champions. The tournaments would include hand-to-hand -hand combat, contests of strength or accuracy, and sometimes, uh, you know, jousts. Uh, it would give Henry the opportunity to demonstrate his courage and physical prowess and be knighted in front of the nobility of Europe. But Henry rejected this suggestion. Tournaments might be a suitable field for the minor nobility or the sons of merchants, but not for the Portuguese royal house. Instead, Henry and his two brothers suggested a campaign against Suta. King John originally dismissed this idea. He believed that a campaign against the Moors would leave their country defenseless against Castile uh, if it decided to break the peace treaty. But the sons of King John were not deterred. All of them wanted to attack Suta, but none more so than Prince Henry. We actually have a record of what Henry said to his father, King John. He, this, is, this is what he said. Everything we do in this world must be based on three factors, the past, the present, and the future. In the past, my father, you had nothing but this city of Lisbon on your side. Nearly all the strongholds of Portugal were barred against you. Yet all the same, and with the help of God, you triumphed. You are stronger now, and there is no reason to think that God's help is withdrawn from you. To judge then from the past, I maintain that if you did not then fear Castile, there is less reason why you should do so now. As for the present, reason again tells me that you should not shrink from war against the infidels out of fear of Castile. The Castilians are Christians like ourselves, whereas the others are our natural enemies. As for the future, I cannot see how the capture of Suta can in any way be construed as a threat against Castile. In fact, the Castilians will only see it as further evidence of the strength of our nation. It will deter rather than encourage them. They will also see that our taking Suta will one day facilitate the conquest of Granada, something that can only please them. Okay, end quote. So King John was so impressed with what his son had said that he decided not only to support the campaign, but to put the 17 year old in charge of organizing it. For three years, the country was occupied with the preparations. Everywhere in Portugal, men were busy preparing for war. In Lisbon, the noise of activity was so great that in the quiet villages along the river, the ceaseless clamor was heard even above the noise of daily life. At night, the glare of the furnaces could be seen for miles around, 
casting eerie shadows over the hills behind the city. The fleet set sail in 1415 on the Feast of St. James. It was one of the largest that had ever been assembled. 50,000 men left Portugal that day. 20,000 of them were men at arms, the remainder oarsmen and sailors. The plan of attack was as follows. Prince Henry, in command of 40 or 50 ships, was to anchor in the east the night before the attack, while King John and the main body of the fleet anchored in Suta Bay on the west. At daybreak, on a signal from the king, Prince Henry was to lead his men ashore. It was hoped that the Moorish defenders would flock to the western walls of the city when they saw the bulk of the fleet anchored there. In this way, Prince Henry's forces would be left practically unopposed to establish their beachhead and take the city in the rear. So, you know, it's a basic diversion tactic. The main fleet is at the uh, western walls and Prince Henry's men have anchored elsewhere. And the hope was that the Moors would be so focused on the men anchored near the western walls that Prince Henry and his men would go undetected. And, and that's pretty much exactly what happened. Throughout the long summer night, as ship after ship came to anchor, the Sultan of Sutar ordered men-at-arms to stand on the western walls and shout defiance at the assembled ships. Uh, whilst the men-at-arms shouted at the bulk of the Portuguese fleet, Prince Henry's forces were able to sneak into the small bay in the east undetected. At night, the ships were lively with activity. The men prepared themselves for battle. Some were sharpening their weapons, others polishing their armor. Some confessed their sins, whilst others strung their bows. As the sun started to come up, the landings began. To Prince Henry's profound annoyance, he was not the first man ashore. King John had promised Henry the honor of being the first man to set foot on infidel territory in Africa, and Henry had been waiting for his father's signal. But at the side of armed men landing on the beach in the west, one fighting man in Henry's force could not restrain himself. He ordered the trumpeteers to sound the charge and leapt into a boat. When Prince Henry's forces arrived on the African shore, they found it poorly defended. As they had foreseen, the bulk of the Moorish fighting men were defending the western walls of the city. Prince Henry's forces did not, therefore, have to face men of war. Instead, they faced locals armed with stones, but little more. Even so, they gave way slowly. Some Moors distinguished themselves through their courage. To quote a contemporary uh, Portuguese chronicler, And among all these Moors, there was one, very tall and of a most threatening complexion, all naked, who used no other weapons than stones. But each of the stones that he threw seemed to be hurled by a catapult or cannon. Such was the strength of his arm. The aspect of this moor was such as to inspire terror, since all his body was black as a crow, and he had very long white teeth, and his lips, which were fleshy, were turned back. Uh, when this uh, scary Moorish man died, the spirit went out of the other defenders, they rushed back to the city, leaving the invaders to follow them. Before the defenders could close the vast studded doors against them, uh, the Portuguese were able to pour into the city. Prince Henry led his men to some high ground in the eastern part of the city. Once on top, they paused to get their breath and survey the battle. It was here on this mound that Henry's squires planted his standard. For the first time in centuries, a Christian flag flew over North Africa. King John saw that Henry's forces were in the city. He heard the sound of trumpets and the clash of arms within the walls. He ordered the main attack to begin. In the first stage of the assault, King John was wounded. He was forced to stop at the main gate of the city and watch his men stream past him. Attacked on both sides and overwhelmed by the Portuguese, the Sultan abandoned the city. He and a few other chiefs, together with their wives and valuables, escaped through the gate to the mainland. In the city, discipline began to break down among the Portuguese troops. The attack was no longer a coordinated affair, but a series of individual skirmishes. Many men stopped fighting and began looting houses. Among the chaos, Prince Henry was lost. Most of Henry's followers had drifted away, some to loot and others intent on food and drink. 
you know, they had had nothing to eat since basically the early morning. Um, he alone had been blind to everything but the task of victory. He had gone into the thick of battle by himself. Those who saw him disappear into the thick of the fight believed him dead. His father, encamped at the main gate, was brought word that his uh, favourite son was dead. That he was later found bloody and dishevelled, but still alive. That evening, the last stronghold of Suta, the citadel, fell to the Portuguese. The last of the defenders fled to the mountains and inland villages. The golden city of Suta was taken. The city teemed with soldiers bent on plunder. Rich carpets, jewellery, vases, wine and delicate silks were carried through the streets. Order and discipline had long since gone. They were drawing their pay in the manner of the time. King John was overjoyed to find his son. He listened to tales of Henry's deeds, of how he had led the attack, of how for many hours he had always been in the forefront of battle. He learned that it was Prince Henry who had been the first at the gate of the castle. He had well and truly earned his knighthood. On the first Sunday after the battle, in a cleansed and consecrated mosque, the victors celebrated mass. They sang a hymn as 200 trumpets sounded over the captured city. Above the heads of the king and his sons, two old church bells swung and boomed. Prince Henry had remembered that these bells had been captured years before from a village in Portugal. And, you know, they're captured and they get sent back to Suta. He had made a search for them after the victory, and now, restored to their ancient use, they joined in the thanksgiving. When mass was over, the princes retired to their apartments and put on their armour before returning to the church for the ceremony of knighthood. A contemporary chronicler described the scene as follows. This was a noble sight indeed, for all three of the princes had tall, well-built bodies, and their armour was gleaming and richly adorned. From their belts hung the swords which their mother had blessed. Before them went the trumpets and the drums. I do not believe that there was a single man there who did not take pleasure in beholding them. One after the other, the young princes knelt to receive their knighthood from King John. This was their moment of triumph. Distinguished in their first battle, conquerors of the great city of Suta, they were knighted in a mosque that had been converted to a church. A medieval dream of knighthood with honour had led them to this North African shore, and to this brilliant moment. Throughout their lives, they would remember it. It was the first great European success against the Muslims in their own territory. Suta was also the first European base to be established on the continent of Africa. From it would spring that gradual occupation and colonisation of the entire African continent. The capture of this city had strengthened Prince Henry's self-confidence. All his life, he had heard tales of the Moors, the terror of Christendom, the heathen who had once occupied his own country, Portugal and all of Spain. Yet Suta had fallen easily. Perhaps even the power of the Moors was something of a legend. Three years later, the city that Henry had taken was heavily besieged by Moors from Granada and Fez. Portugal was at risk of losing its stronghold in Africa. Henry returned to the city in order to defend it. Once again, he was put in command of the fleet that was sent to Suta's relief. At the sight of the Portuguese sails lifting over the horizon, the Moors lost heart. Prince Henry had the satisfaction of ending the siege. After saving the city, Henry spent three months in Africa. During this time, he made acquaintance with some of the desert Arabs. These men had information of value. They knew about the caravan routes that ran inland after leaving the coastline. They had valuable information about the interior of the continent. He became obsessed with Africa after this encounter with the desert Arabs. This obsession would stay with him for the rest of his life. Upon returning to Portugal, Prince Henry established himself in the south of the country in a place called Sagres, where the Atlantic meets the southwestern point of Europe. From there, Henry was not too far from Africa. This meant that he could quickly come to Suta's relief if need be. It was also a good place to study the African coastline. Henry sensed that the study of the Atlantic and the African coastline was the key to wealth and power. He would devote himself to this project for the rest of his life. The crusading knight and man of action withdrew from the army 
and became a scientist and scholar. He read the works of Ptolemy and Marco Polo. He established the first school of science in modern Europe, a school dedicated to the exploration of Africa and the Atlantic. Learned men from every background could be found in this school. Arabs, Jews, and Italians, mathematicians, map makers, and shipbuilders all worked for the prince. It is difficult today to understand the magnitude of the task that these men had set themselves. At this time, almost nothing was known about the Atlantic Ocean. Men had always been fascinated by the Atlantic, but before Prince Henry, no one had truly attempted to explore it. There are several reasons for this. The first was the superstitious awe in which the ocean was held. People believed that monsters dwelt in the Atlantic Ocean. Maps from this time depict strange and mythical creatures inhabiting the uncharted waters. Another reason that people were reluctant to sail south in the Atlantic uh, was outlined in the previous episode. Remember, um, Europeans during this time, they believed in this thing called the Torrid Zone. And in this zone, they believed that the sun were, uh, was so hot that it burnt men black. And many sailors believed that, you know, if you went too far south, uh, the eternally rushing water would catch you and sweep you away over the edge of the world. You know, they still believed that the, the earth was flat, it wasn't a sphere. So it is safe to say that most people saw Prince Henry's mission as reckless and dangerous. In fact, most of Prince Henry's contemporaries considered him an sort of an eccentric monomaniac. Throughout his life, he was criticized for wasting valuable resources, he received no backing from the court or the Portuguese merchants. He funded all the ships and expeditions himself and died heavily in debt. Voyage after voyage, the Portuguese slowly made their way down the African coast. Eventually, they passed uh, Cape Bojador, which was at that time the southernmost limit of Christian knowledge. And to the amazement of the voyages, the sea beyond, which Arabian geographers had depicted as boiling with fiery heat and peopled by fearsome sea monsters, was found safe and easy sailing. They outflanked the Moors, came to the land of the Africans, and began prosperous trade in slaves, ivory, and gold. Henry died in 1460. After 42 years of enthusiastic exploration and research, his sailors had gone further south than any other Europeans, they had made it all the way to Sierra Leone, but more importantly, uh, he had inspired the Portuguese imagination and stirred their ambition. Portugal became the most famous nation of the new age, the age of discovery. To him, more than any other individual, we owe the direction that the world was to take in the succeeding 500 years. When he died, half of the Atlantic and the west coast of Africa had been explored, and all the central and eastern Atlantic islands had been charted. At the time of his death in 1460, Australia was still an unknown continent, but it was Prince Henry alone who had initiated and set in motion its discovery. This is why the uh, Scottish poet William Mickle said, what is Alexander in all his glories crowned with trophies at the head of his armies compared with Henry contemplating the ocean from his window on the rock of Segress. You may disagree with that quote. You may say you can't compare Henry the Navigator to Alexander the Great, but one thing is beyond dispute. They were both great men. Today, the uh, great man theory of history is largely discredited. Historians now tend to emphasize the influence of political, economic, and cultural forces in shaping historical events rather than attributing them to uh, individuals. But this is not the case with Prince Henry of Portugal. He represented no general trend of thinking, no popular movement. In fact, he defied the economic and political trends of his time. As I said before, nobody in the court supported him. The mercantile class in Portugal did not support him. He was generally held to be a fanatical monomaniac rather than a genius. And this brings me to a point that I want to make. I believe in heroes. I believe in great men. My favorite historian uh, is Will Durant. I think he's my favorite historian because he focuses mainly on the great man 
and women of history, rather than on political or economic forces. He wrote a great essay, which I'm going to quote. The essay is called A Shameless Worship of Heroes. Okay, I'm reading the essay now. Of the many ideals which in youth gave life a meaning and radiance missing from the chilly perspectives of middle age, one at least has remained with me as bright and satisfying as ever before. The shameless worship of heroes. In an age that would level everything and reverence nothing, I take my stand with Victorian Carlyle and light my candles at the shrines of great men. The real history of man is not in prices and wages, nor in elections and battles, nor in the even tenor of the common man. It is in the lasting contributions made by geniuses to the sum of human civilization and culture. The history of France is not, if one may say it with all courtesy, the history of the French people. The history of those nameless men and women who tilled the soil, cobbled the shoes, cut the cloth, and peddled the goods, for these things have been done everywhere and always. The history of France is the record of her exceptional men and women, her inventors, scientists, statesmen, poets, artists, musicians, philosophers and saints, and of the additions which they made to the technology and wisdom, the artistry and decency of their people and mankind. And so with every country, and so with the world. Its history is properly the history of its great men. What are the rest of us but willing brick and mortar in their hands, that they may make a race a little finer than ourselves? Therefore, I see history not as a dreary scene of politics and carnage, but as the struggle of man through genius with inertia, the struggle to understand, control, and remake himself and the world. I see men standing on the edge of knowledge, holding the light a little further ahead. Men carving marble into forms ennobling men. Men molding peoples into better instruments of greatness. Men making a language of music and music out of a language. Men dreaming of final lives and living them. Here is a process of creation more vivid than in any myth, a godliness more real than in any creed. To contemplate such men, to insinuate ourselves through study into some modest discipleship to them, to watch them at their work and warm ourselves at the fire that consumes them. This is to recapture some of the thrill that youth gave us when we thought at the altar or in the confessional that we were touching or hearing God. Too soon we extinguish that flame of our hope and our reverence. Let us change the icons and light the candles again. Isn't that beautiful? Will Durant has to be one of the greatest prose writers of the 20th century. And I feel like that essay sums up everything I'm trying to do. Let us change the icons and light the candles again. Let us warm ourselves at the fire that consumes them. That's the point of this podcast. I want to once again light candles at the shrines of great men like Henry the Navigator and Captain Cook. And that's why I'm going to focus on individuals rather than on you know, economic or technological forces. Another line from that essay that struck me was, I see men standing on the edge of knowledge and holding the light a little further ahead. And that line perfectly describes almost everyone that will be mentioned in this series. It describes Henry the Navigator. It describes Captain Cook. Uh, you know, the, the, the heroes of Europe's past, they were not criminals. The men that discovered Australia were not criminals. They were men that stood on the edge of knowledge and held the light a little further ahead.